Good day and uh, welcome to uh, uh, another offering from IISE in our Global Performance Excellence webinar series. Uh, today we're launching uh, a mini series in uh, that's going to focus on artificial intelligence, uh, a, a hot topic for sure. And um, I'm joined by uh, Ben Amaba from Sonotype and Matea Scuda, who is a senior consultant with Deloitte, uh, Jared Frederici with the Fourier Group, and uh, John Cremona with Gardens Alive. And um, <clears throat> so uh, I appreciate them taking time uh, from busy schedules. Um, I, I picked these uh, four gentlemen because um, the the real focus of this mini series on AI is is really to is really about the intersection of operational analytics and AI, how AI can speed up analytics, but more importantly, benefits realization in the organizations that we serve. Uh, and uh, all four of these gentlemen are well-versed in both analytics as well as AI. And so I felt that that was a, a good fit. So we're looking forward to sharing uh, some insights on uh, foundational definitions of things. Um, so I'm going to tee up for about five to 10 minutes here, and then uh, I'm going to walk the, the panel through a, a series of conversations, give them an opportunity to share their perspectives and points of view, and then we'll close out and talk a little bit about what's ahead with the, the rest of the AI mini-series. So once again, thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll share uh, tomorrow, you'll get a Zoom uh, AI message. Uh, that uh, tells you how to get access to the recording, the presentation. Um, Alex uh, Antic is going to be feeding you uh, links throughout the presentation to, that'll help you know how to get to things. Um, we have YouTube versions, we've got snippet versions, 10 to 12 minutes long, and then we've got the full the full uh, version with, uh, with chaptering so that you've got some chapters in there. Use the chat function. Uh, I'll monitor the chat questions and comments, and I'll weave those into our webinar today. And for those of you who value certificates of participation, IIS emails those out usually within a week after the, the webinar. So we've had a number of mini series uh, starting back in the fall of 2022. The first one had to do with <clears throat> the build off of Jim Tompkins' new book, Writing, Writing the Ways of Disruption. And so we talked about the strategies for managing through what what was appearing to be a turbulent uh, 2022 and 2023 from an economic perspective. And then we did a short mini series on supply chain management, and we just are now just finishing up our operational analytics uh, mini series and launching AI. At the end of every one of those mini series, they've culminated in an article that we've published in the IILC magazine. Uh, and so back in in uh, in December of, of 2022, and then April and then August, most recently in August, the, the operational analytics webinar. All of these webinars are stored on the IISC website. They're on demand. Um, the the webinars, uh, the uh, OA, the operational analytics, and the AI webinars will be in the operational analytics bucket. Uh, we I could have put them in the Industry and Service Systems Engineering 4.0, but I decided to put it in the OA bucket. So you can look for them there. Um, as I said, you can go to the IIS, IISE website and get access to all those webinars, some 250 webinars now that have been recorded there on various topics. Or you can go to the Poirier Group and you can get to a YouTube versions. We've got a YouTube channel. And as you can see, we've got the short versions, the 14-minute versions, and then we've got the longer full version. So lots of ways for you to get to the material after the session is over. So um, I'm not going to read through all this stuff here. This is this is the uh, sort of the foundational concept behind the AI series. Um, really, I think what what we want to talk about. We're all industrial and systems engineers, so we want to talk about the practical, emerging, evolving applications of AI and Supply chain management, manufacturing systems, engineering, healthcare and life sciences, retail, uh, operations research, human factor systems engineering, management systems engineering, and so forth. So we're really focused on sort of a, a subdomain of AI. I mean, AI, AI is huge. We'll talk about the, the, the breadth of the domain. We're really focused on the practical applications of making organizations more efficient, more effective, improve quality, improve productivity. 
So we've got this this session today, one, what we call 101, and then 201 will be the 7th of September. And, and we're going to shift from what are the possibilities, what is AI, and what are the possibilities that AI represents for us, um, to what are the challenges, what are the threats, what are the failure modes, what are the risks, and so sort of risk management and risk mitigation conversation. And then we'll we'll get into more how how do you actually deploy AI in the organization? So Johnny and Jared and Mateus and Ben are doing that in their their domains of, of work that they're in right now. And so we'll talk more about that. And then 401, we'll we're gonna find a best practice organization, somebody who's been doing this and really good at it. It might be bright one of the bright factories um, <clears throat> that we that we talk about you know, where they've they've really done sort of industry 4.0 and headed towards 5.0. I, th I thought, you know, I, I when I thought about putting this together, um, it, it, it occurred to me that, that what's really happening is what, what I call sense-making. A guy named Carl White wrote a book on uh, sense-making way back in the, in the 70s and 80s. Um, and you've got a very much an ever-changing world and AI is a, you could see it as a disruptor. I guess it is a disruptor in some respects, but it's certainly messy. It's complex. There's a lot of interrelated components. And so, you know, what, what I think we really want to do is talk about how do we learn together? How is we, as a community, and when I say community, I mean, well, we're a community. IISE is a community, um, but the internet's a community because the internet took it, it, uh, it puts us in touch with people that have created powerful visualizations of concepts and abstractions that are just at our fingertip. And we can, we can steal them, borrow them. Um, you know, Johnny and I were talking, I, I don't know how you acknowledge people because in most of those visualizations, the name's not even there anymore. So you just use it and say, whoever's out there that did this, thank you very much because it's really cool, you know? So, um, but, but we're really trying to wayfind um, and navigate uh, through dynamic changing technology and figure out how to make it uh, useful to the organizations that we're currently serving. And I, I like this slide, uh, sense making and performance. You know, you, you go through a period where uh, you've got a period of stability and, and organizations performing, and then you get this disruption, this technology, in this case, a technology disruption. And we go through this period where performance drops off. Now, when you say performance drops off, it doesn't necessarily mean that organizations are performing less well, but they're not performing to full potential. So it, it's really not that their their the performance is going down; it's that it could go up and it isn't. And so, as a result, the fact that it could go up and it isn't is a performance gap that makes them less competitive over time. So figuring out how to take advantage of this new technology, these new opportunities, is crucial for an organization to be sustainably co competitive. And again, as I said when I started, th these slides are, uh, those of you that have been through our, our operational analytics uh, uh, series of webinars are probably tired of seeing these things, but uh, there's the uh, there's all these latencies that occur from, you know, a business opportunity or a business event. And then you got this, okay, I got a business opportunity, but I got to have some information to know how to capitalize on it. So I've got to capture latency. I've got to get the right data latency. Then I got to analyze the data latency. Then I got a decision latency. Uh, then I've got an implementation and action latency. And then I've got a latency for the, the lag between when I actually do something and when the benefit starts to get realized. So all those latencies, to me, when I think about AI, AI is a major driver for, for, for reducing these latencies. And I know, Ben, that probably resonates with, with you, right? Yeah. So, so I'm going to go through, again, so what's your operational definition of AI? I'm going to, I'm going to ask people to, to, uh, to talk about that. But I'm just going to throw some slides at you real quickly. I've already shared these with the panelists but I'm sharing with them with the audience. I'm not gonna really speak to them, but if you wanna see what MIT, Stanford, Harvard, Carnegie Mellon, you know, well-known professors say, here's some, here's some stuff that, that they say about their definition of AI. And then the one down at the bottom, artificial intelligence, the use of science and engineering, software and hardware or hardware 
to create intelligent machines that can make and or act on decisions that usually require organic intelligence. So that was sort of a summative uh, definition that this person did. I pulled this off for you. I'm not gonna, again, I'm not gonna read it. I'm not even gonna give you enough time to read it, but I gave you the link there. This is kind of cool, the Stanford artificial intelligence definition. So again, this is that sense making. We can go out at a fingertip in two minutes, I found this. And so I'm part of a community of people that are wanting to learn and progress our understanding of AI and how to apply it and make it happen. I've become part of that community. And, and AI is in a sense, making that possible for us today. I don't know whether, you know, for somebody that started in engineering with a slide roll, I, I don't know that the young kids today can appreciate how much change has happened since 1970 at Ohio State and today. It's, it's like, Mind-boggling, it's, it's just incredible. So um, core areas of artificial intelligence, I just, all I'm doing is I pick abstractions, I pick visualizations that I like, and I thank whoever did this because I appreciate being able to use it. So these are just examples, right? So, in, and by, I, by seeing core areas of AI application, we can better understand what it is. Core areas of another another view of that, right? So I'm just showing you another view. And this is actually, you can see this is slide is 100% editable. So this is one of those slides where you can go in and you don't even have to do the framework. You just go in and type the words you want, right? So that's pretty neat. So uh, I'll stop now and ask the panel to jump in. The focus of this little discussion module is um, helping the audience better understand AI. From your perspective. Yeah, uh, Dr. Sink, I think uh, AI is, like you said, uh, morphing, but it's been around since the 1960s. But I think three elements are going to continue to change the definition, change the way we look at. That's the data. Of course, that's growing exponentially. I think it's the models. Uh, back to your operation analytics. You know, there are certain techniques that ISEs use that is being adopted by the AI community from linear regression uh, to logistical regression. And then of course the governance, the model itself, the process. When any of those three wheels change the data, the model or the process, it readapts itself. One of the benefits of AI is its uh, ability to adapt uh, to deal with the latency. So I thought you said that really well and how you uh, put AI in uh, the framework of latencies and the benefits. Yeah, yeah, good, thanks, Ben. Anybody else have something you'd like to add, comment? Jared, do you wanna go? I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we've all got opinions on it, certainly. I think just uh, a simplest term is just computer systems designed to mimic you know, human intelligence in the context of Oh, in our application, operational analytics, but there's a lot of other applications. Uh, I think it tends to be an umbrella term with machine learning and deep learning uh, as subsets. And I think you've got some portrayals, Scott, that show some of that. So I think it uh, is an umbrella term, but um, I don't know. I think part of today, it's kind of demystifying some of the language because I think some of the language on this makes it seem a little more complex than mm -hmm. it may ought to be. And trust me, there is lots that's quite complex and certainly well beyond me but i think at, at the highest level i see it as an umbrella term uh and somebody had written i think trevor uh on referencing neural networks and the importance of that in the context of machine learning and deep learning um but uh that i think that's absolutely critical to understand as you start to dive a little bit down the rabbit hole on this but yeah and I'm sure yeah. yeah that that point you made is a good point that sort of segues into this next so if you if you looked at AI and you started to peel the onion back, so to speak, on it, um, you know you start to get into a, an additional set of and domains of words, right? So you get into data science, you get into machine learning, deep learning, and so I think for someone to fully appreciate AI, uh, you have to understand. And I got a bunch of pictures here that I think help do that. I think you have to understand. You know, sort of the evol historical evolution of, of of AI in the context of of machine learning, and then when machine learning came in and deep learning came in, and um, so 
Johnny, I know I interrupted you there, but but I think that these slides sort of move us in the direction of further clarifying what AI really is, because it's a it's like a a, a Venn diagram where the circles are inside of one another, so to speak. Yeah, to me, AI is a tool. You've got all these specific tools within here, right? That eventually enable you to get to a decision making much faster than ever possible. Yep. That's really what ultimately you're trying to do. And so AI is a field in machine learning and deep learning in these concentric circles are basically different subsets of tools that are automated in ever evolving as Ben uh, wrote as well. <laughs> it, it, it ages like milk, not like wine. I like that. <laughs> and so it's really enabling you to make decisions much faster and be able to be more effective at any uh, anything that you're trying to achieve. Yeah, and and I, think this I know slide, that sounds very broad. Oh yeah, go yeah, ahead. <laughs> and I think this slide, Johnny, speaks to what you said. So, you know, you can't really talk about AI and not talk about machine learning, deep learning, but you also can't talk about it and not talk about data analytics and data science. Um, and so I think, you know, this picture is useful. I think this is, I'm not even going to stop on this one, but this is, I, I had one of these slides. That, I had a slide like this for integrated Lean Sigma. This is a slide for AI, which I think is sort of cool if you look at, it's the evolution of science and popular culture, you know, so you got movies about the science, right? Movies about AI. So it's kind of neat to look at that as that has evolved. And um, so, um, and I, I'll stop here and let us continue to talk just a little bit. So in broad terms, deep learning is a subset of machine learning and machine learning is a subset of AI. So you guys buy that? I mean, does that make sense? That's what I pulled out in my, this is not chatbot stuff, by the way. This is, chat, <laughs> this is me doing a little bit of homework and picking the stuff that made sense to me. It totally does. And before we go deep into like AI versus ML, I want to also clarify some terms for the everybody listening that regardless of what article you read nowadays, you're probably going to hear not just artificial intelligence, but you probably will hear like narrow artificial intelligence. You'll probably hear general artificial intelligence and then super. Those are the three biggest buckets that when you show that big circle of artificial intelligence, you have these three, I guess, separate circles that each of them encompass a type of AI. So the first one and what's more prevalent nowadays, and honestly, all that's prevalent is what's called the narrow artificial intelligence. So ANI, I believe. And this is pretty much a very specific task oriented, like playing chess, right? When AI beat the, I don't know, not Kasparov, but one of the you know, grandmasters of the world or translating, which we use every day. So those are the, the, the use cases we see nowadays. Now, a lot of what people talk about and we see in these articles are more the general. So the AGI, which is pretty much mimicking everything human-esque. It's when AI will get to the point that they can do anything a human, a normal human can. And then there's artificial superintelligence, which is the next step, which is what you can do more, be more efficient, be... <laughs> you know, produce anything faster than any human alive. So those, those are the three steps in progression of AI. And I think we're currently in, we obviously are NAI, but all the conversation we hear and, you know, the fears is more like AGI and ASI. So I thought that was important, just like add to the definition of AI. Yeah, yeah. And and um, I think that's that's good, Matthias. And uh, this, this, uh, this material that I'm sharing on this slide is from an, an article that uh, IBM, a blog that IBM put together, which I which I thought was useful. Um, one of our participants said, I'm not sure why we need to define AI, it's undefinable. I, I don't know that I agree it's undefinable. Um, it, it may not be that important that you define it, although I think Deming, Deming uh, pushed hard on creating solid operational definitions of things that you know you're working with. So I would recommend focusing on the why, in other words, the use cases and the benefits, which I agree with. I think that, again, and that goes back to, Ben, what we talked about in terms of reducing latencies, the use cases really are speed things up, right? Do things, do things better, do things faster, free up human beings, free up human beings to do higher order thinking uh, is, I think, really the, the ultimate end with this. 
And the question is, how do we do that systematically and rationally and, and mitigate any risks that might evolve as we move in this direction? So, um, so I'd like, uh, so the relationship between analytics and, and, uh, and AI, uh, and so I, I like this slide. I know it's really busy, but, you know, sort of in this slide, this visualization on the left-hand side was sort of our op analytics mini series, Jared, I think you, you can see that. On the right-hand side is the AI mini series, right? So, so you know, I think that the two series, mini series being back-to-back -back makes a lot of sense. And, um, so I don't know. What do you, does this resonate with you guys? Do you like this picture, Brendan? We know Brendan Tierney gave it to us, so thanks, Brendan. I do, and it, and it it speaks to what the panel, the somebody made the comment, right? It's you can't really define, and this kind of shows it, right? It's if if you ask any of us to, to create recreate this map, it would be completely different. All these intersectionalities are different, and they vary by project, they vary by use case. They're always, you know, it's a constant shift. And that's the beauty of it. We can try to get, you know, these buckets and define them and say, hey, ML is a subset of AI, which then deep learning, and then you get neural networks part of it, right? But it it's use case based. You know, it does change the it's it's a constant shifting and molding. And it does resonate tremendously. <laughs> you gotta you gotta be, you know, a jack of all trades and an organization in, in itself has to be in order for you to be able to leverage its full capacity. Yeah. Yeah, and then and then we talked a lot, uh, Jared. We talked a lot in the operational analytics thing about uh, different types of analytics. Uh, and Johnny, you've talked a lot about. In fact, you're doing some work with with predictive and prescriptive analytics. And so, and you know that you really can't do that well unless you harness the the power of of AI. Absolutely. Uh... I gave a earlier we were chatting and uh, we've got we got some GPS devices that are are following buses and sometimes you lose signal from the GPS device whether it's a cloudy day whether you go next to a mountain whatever the case may be you lose that signal so how do you predict in real time as soon as you you miss a GPS device signal how do you predict where could that be so that I could show that. And, and predict that until I get that back. And so without a machine learning model, there's no way to do that because I have to take historical data as to how this route has, um, has performed over the past 20 days, for example, take that and say, this is where I believe it is, and then auto-correct once I get the signal back. And so that's just one general example that mm -hmm. uh, otherwise we wouldn't have signal, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think as we move in a direction, I, I think in, we talked about this in the operational analytics, you know, most, most organizations, to be quite honest, are still struggling with descriptive, descriptive analytics. I mean, you know, they're, they're struggling to get, you know, their data rich information poor or their data poor. They don't, they don't have any of the right data. And so even if they had great analytics, it wouldn't make any difference because they don't capture the right data, you know? And so, um, we're still struggling down there. So there's a huge leap, a huge leap for most small, medium-sized enterprises to make, just going from descriptive and and doing a great job with that so that you can even position yourself to be able to do prescriptive and, and predictive work. So there's huge opportunities. And Jared, jump in. I Go ahead. I, I want you to- No, I think to Julia's question earlier, I think this is because what's happening is you know, ChatGPT and OpenAI as they release freeware and organizations are, are starting to see how it's a bit demystified. Even though they may not understand it, they might start leveraging it. So you're seeing pockets of, you know, prescriptive and autonomous systems and organizations departmentally where people get excited about this. So you see pockets of higher maturity excitement and curiosity where most of the rest of the organization is you know, still in the data cleansing or reporting phase. So we're seeing a dichotomy of departmental maturities and organizational maturity around analytics. And the scary part about this is oftentimes, you know, it's really scary to start to do supervised and even unsupervised learning based on corrupt data and stuff. So I think that, um, Julia, to your point, most organizations are probably in the 
lens, the standard reports, maybe some OLAP, maybe some data cubes. But on top of that, people are getting excited departmentally, exposing you know, some of their company private information to ChatGPT um, and doing things with it, making interpretations based off of it to create a dichotomy of maturity in the organization. I think the cybersecurity and privacy issues around AI and some of these uh, open AI and chat GPT um, is a really interesting sub segment because you've got to be really, really careful. But I think that's yeah. maybe uh, uh, for another day. Yeah, and, and uh, one of the uh, audience members said that uh, data is the independent variable. And that's an interesting comment. But, you know, it's if you if you thought about a design of experiment or a analysis of variance, the data so the quant, the right quantity and quality, the right data, certainly is a major, major factor in analytics or AI. Because Johnny, without data, you couldn't do what you said about, uh, you know, because you wouldn't have any historical data to 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 um, to do predictive predictive uh, analytics with. <laughs> right, and it depends on the use case. In that use case, an yep. ML model is is the the way to go because I had that historical data. Yeah, and the use case really tells you what your data model has got to be. It tells you what data elements you require. So if you aren't capturing those data elements, then you know that you've got to fill that gap. You've got to capture those things, right? I think, Scott, though, in terms of deep learning models, though, there's definitely a field now, which is, you know, you may not have historicals. You're just uploading raw data and you're letting... Uh, some of these deep learning neural networks do pattern recognition and create features or detect features automatically. So I think, Johnny, that kind of speaks to the differentiation between ML and deep learning, where you've got supervised learning with an input where you're sort of saying, yes, this is right, no, this is wrong, and then it learns versus deep learning where it's doing that looped automatically. And so I don't know if you want to speak to that, Johnny, on sort of deep learning yeah. versus machine learning and how you've had to sort of guide it with inputs on the ML side so that it knows when it can correct it and make a better prediction. Yeah, so well, in the, in this case on the GPS, that's not the, uh, I, I never went into the deep learning piece. It was only ML, but uh, one simple example is if, you, if you've ever played a, just a video game, okay? And you're, you always have an objective on the video game, whether you uh, get the most points or whatever, um, you can create a model that's testing out all the different variations of what you can potentially do within that video game. If you if it's just jumping, right, and it's just moving as an example, it you can iterate through thousands of iterations at the same time to for the model to basically learn what are the steps I need to take to maximize my my end goal, right? And so the, the video game is a simple example, but when you apply that to the real world, hey, my goal is to minimize my costs maximize bit profit in general sense, right? You you don't have to use uh, any historical data to be able to do that. It's goal seeking at that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that sounds a lot like operations research, um, but this is just on, it's operations research uh, on steroids basically, because those decisions are being made automatically and improved upon automatically. Yeah, yeah. So I, I've got some other slides in here. I'm just going to zip through these just just to make sure that the audience knows what's what's in here in terms of uh, resource material for you. I got some other slides in here that that probably this speaks more to to the operational analytics conversation. Um, and then I've, I've thrown a few more aha moment visualizations that I found. So that just sort of struck me as interesting when you think about AI versus machine learning. I don't know whether these examples make sense, but I guess, Johnny, the, 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 the questions at the bottom are examples of use case, right? And so sort of what to exactly. what you said, if I wanna look at the MIR scan, does this patient have cancer? That's gonna require some deep learning. Yes, Right, absolutely. so I've got it, my system's gotta be set up to do that. So, you know, I guess, you know, I think this is a, this is an interesting slide to get us to think about the distinction between the layers of the onion in in AI, so to speak. And and to your point, not every problem requires deep learning. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> God, I think this is good because I think on the machine learning side with ice cream sales, 
Uh, it goes back to the notion more of supervised learning where uh, there are features, fields, rows that have characteristics that typically uh, a data scientist is encoding so that it runs through these nodes. You get feedback back whether it's right or wrong, and then it learns and it chooses the next node based on what it's learned from the previous. Whereas on the MRI scan piece, you know, to, to have a data scientist take millions of images of cancer and create features and create metadata associated with that, it's going to take, could be years. So deep learning algorithms is you're taking the raw pictures um, as data, putting into a deep learning algorithm, and it's automatically detecting patterns and features that it can learn from itself on. And so sometimes the differentiate between those is how much time do you have? Um, and so if you invest the time in you know, a few sets of really strong looped algorithms on the deep learning side, you can have it automatically detect those patterns and features yeah. that otherwise would take humans years potentially to do. Yeah. yeah. Both time and data, right? Because if you don't have enough data, it's just a viewpoint trying to run these algorithms because it won't get anything accurate. <laughs> That's a great point, Mateus Bad. I mean, because there's also data implications in terms of quantity. I think nowadays there's some, you can still do some deep learning with uh, smaller than normal data sets, but you tend to need quite a bit and you tend to need some serious processing speed as you take these on. Right? Yep. Yeah. So I got a question for you. So I, I like to think of simple examples, you know, that I think. AI is is ubiquitous. It's meaning it's pervasive. It's everywhere, everywhere. It's been around for actually a long time. So, you know, Kroger. So I get Kroger coupons and it's amazing how, you know, they come in, they seem to come in exactly when I run out of, of uh, hamburger or whatever. And they got, and they got my coupon. So the coupons come in and I go, how did they know I needed this? Right? So between point of sales and those coupons arriving at my door, there really isn't any human being making any decisions. Now, I, I would, I, I don't know whether that's machine learning. It almost feels like deep learning being utilized because they're, they're predicting my behavior. They're reinforcing certain behaviors. I would, where, how would you classify that application? Because I think everybody can relate to getting coupons from a grocery store, right? Yeah, well, and, and to add to that, actually, there was a, a news article that came out in 2012 about Target figuring out that there was a young lady uh, that was actually pregnant. So they, they sent coupons to her for things uh, that a pregnant uh, lady would need, but her father had no idea. So it, oh. the coupons were sent to the house and he's just like, why are you sending these coupons to my daughter? And so they were able to figure out and predict from her buying patterns that, hey, this is really the next step. This is what, what's happening without even the family knowing, which, wow. Uh, yeah. So, so <laughs> just to reiterate that, that was, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send the link to that. There's an, <laughs> there's an example of a failure mode to talk about next time, Ben. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So um, I, I, I like this. I like this visualization too. Um, and I'm not sure I understood all of it. But it it spoke it seemed to me to be something that what do you guys think about this one? Do you what does it say to you? What's it speak to you? Well, I think it, uh, one it speaks to the importance of a foundational understanding of IEs on neural networks and node analysis because I think that's the you know, that's yeah. what we're seeing how you know how you interact between nodes. Uh, and layers of nodes, um, independent of the operational definition, getting some basic exposure to neural networks and understanding layers of neural networks and how paths um, you know, are chosen and then learned from, and then the next path is chosen and how basic predictions work. I think if you can get that, that crosses over a lot of these different definitions, if you will. So to me, it actually, yeah, oh, go ahead, Johnny. No, it was me, but it, has, it says a lot, but at the same time, it doesn't. You know, it's it's very nice to see, at least have a visual to try to kind of relate to it. But again, it's it's so dependent on use case, for example, deep learning. You're not just going to have to, so the difference between a neural network versus deep learning is when you have more than the three levels of nodes, three plus becomes deep learning. 
So, you know, when I look at this, okay, deep learning doesn't mean if it's four or five, it's good to get a sense of what it could be, but at the same time, it, it doesn't say too much, you know, just, <laughs> it's very, very use case dependent. And so whether the, it's a GPS case or the Kroger case, yeah. Jared, you so, said something, you said something a little bit uh, earlier. So the, the nature of the phenomena that you're trying to make recommendations for would determine the number of hidden layers in deep learning? So the, the more complex the behavior or the, the dependent variable, the outcome variable, would mean that you need more hidden layers to understand the phenomena. Is that generally true? Yeah, again, it goes back to Matesa's point on use case. So a lot of deep learning neural network structures are done in the context of uh, pattern recognition for images yeah. or facial recognition, in which case, you know, those features like edge identification, um, you know, the, the whole example of how can you create a deep learning network uh, to associate a picture of a pet? You know, how do I know if this is a cat, a dog? You know, you would start with, okay, how many legs does it have? What color is it? So all of these different, so how many legs and what color and does it have a tail or not? All of these layers, as Mateus indicated, as those start to get three plus, four, five, six, you move into layered deep learning neural networks and how, so again, you could start with an image and say whether it's a cat or a dog. And from just a traditional machine learning perspective, supervised learning, you could give it an input and say, okay, dog equals one, cat equals two. And you could have it loop through it and you get instant feedback and it learns from that. But a deep learning model would be that you don't provide any input, it's unsupervised learning. And it automatically goes through these layered neural networks to determine those features and then learn from itself what the distinguishing factors are automatically. So I think mm -hmm. I like the pet image recognition because it helps simplify some of those layers. Oh, so I'm, I'm going to make the assumption because everyone here is most likely ISE and we have a basis for statistics. Okay. Imagine that it's your first day in statistics and you're presented with a graphic like this that shows linear regression, nonlinear regression, ANOVA. It, it, it's sort of, you don't really know in that first day, what does this even mean? Like, where would I ever use this? So I liken it to that in terms of once you get into, okay, what are the use cases for these different tools and just replace these with a non- linear regression versus a linear regression this is when you would use it it's very similar in that manner for me this this graphic and i do see a question uh could ai replace data data scientists um i think uh, from my perspective the data scientists that we know today will have to morph so it's not a replacement of the data scientists it's that it, they're gonna have to pick up new learnings, new new abilities to be able to work with this new technology. It's similar to say, well, um, we'll, well, no, that's a bad example. Never mind, but does that make sense? Anybody yeah. want to say? <laughs> and is chat GPT narrative science? Is that what they mean by narrative science? Um, it's more of a, a natural language generation, chat GPT. So it's more, it, it doesn't know, and I'm not going to assume that anybody knows. So it, it doesn't necessarily know whether what it's giving you is correct or not. It's looking at the patterns of your, of what you've been typing and then coming up with an answer. But it it depends on how it was trained. I guess yeah, Johnny, it's a, it's a NLP, right? A natural language processor, which processing mechanism, which is a branch of uh, ML and deep learning. It uses some of those, uh, mm -hmm some of those algorithms to, as I understand it, it's really based on the notion of tokens and characters. I think uh, what ChatGPT, which is OpenAI's app, is based off of is about 500 billion tokens. So imagine the open web uh, and a database of what they call tokens. And so they're not characters or, or strings of text. Tokens are the relationship between characters and human language. So imagine a statistical encoded 
number essentially a relationship between words there's about 500 billion of those that reside in a massive database that deep learning networks automatically work on pattern pattern recognition to help from a user prompt give you an answer back sort of a chatbot on steroids but that's so i see that almost as a branch i like this picture but what it doesn't show is the how things are subsets, the taxonomy or the hierarchy between them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just adding to your point, Jared, so it's not just an NLP, it's just a part like ChatGPT. NLP is what the part that it under, it translates what somebody's typing, and then it goes through all the statistics and understand ex exactly what you described. Uh, but it's more than that. ChatGPT is AI, and AI, for it to be AI, has to have machine learning, uh, potentially a cognitive aspect. So whether it's visual computer vision or NLP, all embedded, and that makes it AI. That's also a difference of like what machine learning versus AI is. So we've already, we, I think this is segue this into this next question. What, what are some simple examples of AI at work that, uh, and I, I already talked about the, so here's some examples of how AI is impacting our, our lives that we may or may not be conscious about. We may, may or may not, uh, see or understand as being being AI being applied in the world that we live in. Um, here's here's even more more examples with more detail. Um, so I think you can see that uh, as I said, it's uh, it's pretty much everywhere. Uh, and uh, at least at this point in my life, I can't imagine getting getting along without uh, Google Maps, even though uh, it may make me dumber every time I use it. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, so uh, again, these are just some visualizations I pulled that uh, that represent applications of AI, so that we can start to move in that direction as the webinars progress. Um, I, I saw this this morning. I pulled it off literally uh, uh, maybe two hours ago. Uh, unmanned AI jet takes off successful flight for Air Force's autonomous aircraft program. So they've got this collaborative combat aircraft system that they're building. And basically, they're going to have an AI managed wingman uh, for a groups of groups of uh, planes. Uh, so these are, you know, and just these are just a, you know, a, a, almost an ad hoc example of uh, how this this is uh, progressing. Um, I guess, Jared, you, I didn't know whether this slide has relevance, but I, I think that it does from an industrial engineering perspective, because I think that, you know, back office automation, for example, uh, is a big deal for a lot of companies. And so putting um, back office automation in the context of the evolution to machine learning and artificial intelligence, I think is important for industrial engineers to understand. Do you want to just comment on this briefly? No, I, I really like this portrayal. A lot of organizations are starting to dabble, especially in the Microsoft Power uh, Automate and Microsoft uh, Power Platform stack. A lot of organizations have that. And there's a number of other competitors to that too, but people are playing around with uh, RPA just through Power Automate and, uh, and, and reducing or eliminating steps with some simple apps. But you can see that uh, you, know, you can begin to do that with digital triggers uh, versus manual interventions. Um, and you know, as you move up the, the ladder on, uh, okay, let's take away that, let's actually create process mind data and put some machine learning in place to uh, automatically do this. And so I, I really like this. I think a lot of organizations as a good starting point, especially in the mid market are starting to play around with RPA as a, sort of a stepping stone or an appetizer, if you will, into this roadmap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then this one, we I think we could talk about a long time. Uh, it's sort of it's got some profoundness to it. Um, you, you know, it starts to talk about the criticality of the decision that you're supporting with data sciences, AI, uh, and then the uh, the extent of explainability required. And so just different examples. So I, I'm just curious when when the pan, when you panelists look at this, um, does this resonate with you the way it resonated with me? Yeah, absolutely. All right. When safety uh, comes into play and you get into time latency, you know, immediate responses, 
uh, the governance model has to be a little bit more stringent, right? Uh, more governed. So as you go from IT to OT, most AI machines in the 60s, 80s, and even 90s were used in an IT context. But as you move into operational technology, it becomes more safety critical to the public's health, safety, security, and environment. Yeah, Ben, I don't know if you could speak to maybe some of the, on the cybersecurity side, you know, a lot of organizations as ChatGPT has made some of this a little more consumable. Um, at the same time, it's exposed threats to cybersecurity and privacy competencies within organizations. So the need for governance and hey, you know, before you start exposing your privately held or publicly held company information into ChatGPT, you should probably be aware of certain things. Can you comment on maybe the cybersecurity or how careful we have to be on this? Yeah, that's a good point, Jared. It literally is the number one concern globally. In fact, where the drug trade is 450 billion, the cybersecurity industry is 10 trillion. So it is the number one concern with technology, specifically AI. Uh, the uh, cost of the cybersecurity for AI right now is about $9.5 million per incident. So it is the single largest concern worldwide for not only government, uh, but academia and industry. Almost everybody here on the call has probably been breached. Some of us don't even know. In fact, uh, it's now AI versus AI. That's why it's important. So I, I believe, and we can talk about this later, but it's a good point, Jared. Uh, now AI is uh, going against AI. Uh, uh, again, we see cybersecurity issues existing in our systems for an average of 277 days. That's like an invader or a hostile individual in your system or home, let's say, for 277 days. So why is AI important, both the positive side and the good side? You've got to look at both sides of the coin. In order to get the benefits of AI, you've also got to see the negative. And the summation of that, right, is the final outcome. But yeah, that's uh, a discussion in itself, but that's a good point, Jared, uh, to bring up because ISEs are well known in uh, the world of optimization where we can take the physical sciences and the mathematical sciences primarily driven by AI and balance that uh, with the social sciences, transparency, explainability, and bias. So that's, that's the cybersecurity world coming around. So, yeah, and, and that will be, and Jared and Ben, that'll be the, uh, a, a major focus of 201, which is, uh, which, which would be our September session. So, um, uh, Johnny, you've, you've already talked about, um, you know, a, a practical example that you're using that's close to home for, for AI, uh, down in Costa Rica. Um, any other quick examples, uh, Mateus, any quick example, uh, you know, you were you were with Ford a little bit. What would be a, an example of uh, AI-related uh, innovation that you were part of at, at Ford? Yeah, we worked in a predictive maintenance algorithm that, so typically current, well, before this project, how predictive maintenance would happen is somebody would go around the line, they would expect, you know, inspect maybe how long that machine has been working, how many whatever rivets it injected or how many moldings it has cut. And just pretty much have a purchase order, and then you know that pretty much a, a EOQ and replenishing, and then substituting, and then errors would happen. So what we actually did, we tried to intervene and create an algorithm that not only through machine learning would understand the patterns of degradation by the results. So we would test the end product, and then that equate to how much degradation of the equipment. We would also have more of a sensing algorithm that would understand one the inventory out in the market to optimal price for us and logistically how to get that piece in as fast as possible. So it became not just a machine learning algorithm to detect and replenish. It, it would even replenish a little bit before if it, was, if, if it checked other optimal circumstances. Like I said, availability of the part to minimize downtime. Mm -hmm. So that's something that was applicable and we deployed that to all the engine uh, factories worldwide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah, good example. So we're going to do more of that. Um, and uh, we're going to cover 
uh, in the in future sessions, we're gonna I, I threw put this slide together, Jared, because you like slides that show you know different apps and tools and stuff. I think we'll we'll probably get into a discussion, Jared, similar to what we did with the business process management, that the triangle, uh, as we as we move into uh, more discussions around how does an industrial systems engineer what are the things that an industrial and systems engineer needs to know and be able to do in order to bring AI uh, applications to the to the proper use cases, to the proper opportunities, so to speak? That that's the direction I think we want to head with uh, with uh, 301, 401, and 501. So, yeah, go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, I agree. I think you know practically as as IEs and organizations, you know, one simple thing we're working through is just you have a great workshop discussing or doing a process mapping workshop. And so you maybe you got a whiteboard and you talk and you get four or five people, Kaizen event involved. And you know, how long does that take a day, maybe four hours? And maybe you can map some swim lane processes, detect some issues in the processes. But you know, that takes quite a bit of time. We're seeing now, if you can record that workshop, uh, you can expose it to some great uh, natural language processors, get some transcriptions of that recording, and have uh, have it automatically create those swim lane process maps overlaid with pain points and root cause issues. So, you know, when you think of what we do as IEs, you know, we're already doing that now. We're working on the consulting delivery side to um, use natural language processing uh, to help automate and get faster at uh, how we detect root cause in organizations or how we automatically benchmark and detect gaps in the PL. So, you know, these things are happening right now. Um, and so I think that that's probably where we want to focus is demystifying some of it or what are some simple applications, especially for small to mid market, you know, because it is becoming more available. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we took, um, to Jared's point, um, we, we always do a number of interviews of uh, key stakeholders in uh, value streams uh, to get a sense of how does the process work, how does it perform, where is it breaking down, uh, they're trying to identify where are the failure modes in the process. And uh, just long story short, we took, uh, we took, I don't know how many hours of interviews there were but we ran that, the text of those interviews through ChatGPT and asked ChatGPT, uh, this is a short version, it, to pu punch out what are the pain points, what are the common pain points. And it, it dumped out a, a, uh, an, an organized uh, document on the interviews. And when we asked the, the program lead that was working on the project, um, did, the, did the output from the AI tool, did the output miss anything and he said there was one spot where they it missed it 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 misinterpreted something that was said in the interviews one spot out of hours of interviews that's the power that's reducing latency that speeds up the conversion of data into information it's you yeah but i think the, the one thing on that and, and it kind of made us question did, did it misinterpret it or did we misinterpret it but a separate question uh, I do think it's important to just reiterate that, you know, when you start using these tools, work with your IDT departments, understand your data privacy. Um, many times, like us, we've got to create a closed environment, in our case, the Microsoft Azure environment, where, mm -hmm. you know, because your organizations often have public or confidential information. So, you know, we well, we may leverage some of the open AI platforms on a closed database. Just remember that as you put things into ChatGPT company information, that that begins to go public. And I think that it's easy to get excited about this, but the yeah. first step is do not breach your NDAs, do not breach yeah. confidentiality, do not put your company at a disadvantage. So make sure you're very careful as you enter this space on the cybersecurity side. So Jared, that, that point's an example. That's that's one of the things I wanna bring into the 201 conversation. What are the risks? What are the, you know, and there's little things like you just mentioned that sometimes people are not conscious about, they're not aware of, you know, they don't think about it. So yeah, that's what we wanna talk about in September. So. Uh, so we're we're sort of at the tail end here. I got a couple of just close out things. I want to thank uh, Ben and, and Mateus and Jared and Johnny. This is a little bit of an experiment to, you know, just to find some uh, visualizations that 
uh, sort of supported uh, a string of questions. Um, uh, I hope it I hope it worked for the for the panelists. I I think we had uh, you know didn't give give you guys enough time to probably chime in and and talk, but uh, but I felt like the storyline was reasonably clear. If I think about it from the perspective of a of a an audience member, I think I think maybe I I saw a lot of positive feedback in the in the chats as we went along. So I think people valued it. Um, so feel free to please uh, complete our survey and provide us with feedback. Let us know how we can help in the future. Um, LinkedIn links for our speakers were provided on the title slide, so you can get get to them uh, that way. Um, Again, the, the certificates of participation will be out to you within a within a week, and tomorrow you'll get an email right around 11 o'clock that will uh, provide a, 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 a support, uh, will provide you with the uh, the links to get to the recordings and the presentation. Uh, and Alex has been showing you those as we went along today. Um, so what's ahead is uh, September 7th AI 201. Uh, I've invited our four panelists to be part of that uh, once again. Uh, ben will be uh, probably taking a, a front and center role on that to, to talk about the cybersecurity issue, and uh, and then the, the rest of the group will talk about risk risk identification and risk mitigation and management in a in a broader sense. And then on the 31st of August, Jared and I are going to finish out the operational analytics uh, session. People in 501. People called for um, uh, people called for more examples, case examples. So Jared and I are, are putting together uh, a number of uh, practical examples of where we've we've utilized some of the things that we talked about in the, in 501 and the uh, the earlier sessions. In September, I mentioned uh, last week that uh, we have our final four capstone senior design presentations uh, that were. Uh, that actually occurred physically in New Orleans uh, at the IIE conference back in May. Dalhousie University, Virginia Tech, Toronto Metro University, and Georgia Tech will be the four uh, universities that we do in presentations. That's one of my favorite favorite webinars of the year, so uh, I encourage you to, to join us there. And then uh, similarly, the Service Systems Engineering uh, Award winners will be presenting. Uh, Penn State University supports that that uh, competition and award. We've got GM, uh, Purdue, the University of Illinois, and um, and they they're going to focus on uh, industrial engineering, industrial and systems engineering as practiced in in service systems in the service systems domain. So that's a lot of fun. And then October 24th, Jim Tompkins, one of our most popular presenters. Um, past president of IISE is going to talk to us about the evolution of globalization versus deglobalization and and how that will impact in the coming years will impact the role that industrial and systems engineers uh, will will play in uh, in our organization. So we'll sort of zoom up a little bit and get to a sort of a macro global perspective type of conversation with Jim. Um, so as I said, uh, what's up ahead is. Uh, how can AI help? Uh, how AI can help? So AI creates risk. It can also help us mitigate risk. So that'll be part of our conversation. Also, um, you've got risk. You got risk curves. Ben will probably talk about this. You know, we, the the risks are growing as we get uh, as uh, Moore's law and what's the other one, Ben? Metcalf's law. Yeah, Metcalf and more. We got more data, and we can move it faster. So, you know, um, and then and then uh, you know, again, sense making. Uh, there's lots of myths and lots of facts as it relates to uh, to AI, and so um, as we go forward, we'll be um, maybe helping you bust bust some myths uh, a little bit, and um, and and see again, see the possibilities, not be blind to the risks and threats. Uh, but also realize that as industrial and systems engineers, we can manage the risks and threats, and we do it intelligently. Then we can capture the the uh, the potential and the opportunities that AI presents, and uh, and not incur not incur those risks and and costs. So that's what we're all about. That's what our profession is all about. So um, so thanks for joining. We'll I'll end with that, and uh, and uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you next time.